All right, I'd like to call this uh, Thursday, February 6, 2020, meeting of the Finance Committee to order. Tonight will be broadcast by Transit Telemedia and we're following the published and posted agenda. The first item on the agenda is approval of minutes. Has everyone had a chance to review them? Yes. I'm sorry, I totally forgot to read them. And I tried to speed read, but it's too big of a packet. That's <laughs> <laughs> the large one. <laughs> so. so I'm sorry, I apologize. I read it like three weeks ago. Okay, do we want to postpone the vote on that then? I have no idea what I wrote. Or if the others have, can't we just, can't she just I have, abstain? but we don't, we don't have four people to, to vote on it. And we would need four because there were seven present that night. So should we just push it off to? Let's push it off to next week. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I apologize. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. you are excuse just once. <laughs> just once. Just once. I did prep for the meeting, but I just looked at recent emails. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next on the agenda is a discussion of extraordinary unforeseen tuition and transportation expenses. And it looks like Darlene Lucier is here tonight. She's going to discuss uh, this potential transfer. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so I'm here tonight to ask for a reserve transfer for a, um, an unexpected um, expenditure that arose at the beginning of the year. Um, this is for a student that was attending um, his sophomore at um, Neshoba Valley Technical High School. But the class or the curriculum that um, the student wanted to take was not offered at this school. So he's going to go Minuteman okay. Technical High School. Um, when this happens, this f um, falls under, I think it's the chapter, uh, chapter Six, seventy. Uh, I have it written down. Uh, seventy-four. Actually, I think it's chapter seventy-four. Yep. That we're the town um, has to pay the fee for this child to go to the school because it's not offered at, at that other mm -hmm. other school. Along with the tuition, we also have to pay for the transportation costs that go along with transporting that student. Um, so I did forward to you a packet um, of information on that. The tuition from the school and then the transportation cost. So the, the total was the 51,000 um, in total, 51,320. We've already expended about 22, almost $23,000. The students started um, in September. Mm -hmm. uh, so this wasn't budgeted because we were unaware at that time um, that that was happening. We did, uh, the superintendent um, of the Chancellor Schools did reach out to Desi to see if there was any relief that we could do or anything that could be done, but Desi wrote back a letter saying, sorry, but Chancellor, do you have to pay this? So um, so we did try to work with them a little bit. So I did give you the breakdown of what the tuitions, oh, the tuition along with the, um, the student's um, tuition also has, he's a SPED student, so there's a SPED piece to that also. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an annualized cost you left in September? That's an annual, yes, so we've already, um, for the fiscal 21 budget, when Paul and John go through it, you'll see that we're going to be budgeting for that because he's only a sophomore right. so he's, and um so he's not included in our neshoba enrollment he he Good yes <laughs> <laughs> i know i would think that he would be in, he's probably included because of when the transfer happened for the 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 assessment that we were already assessed for 20 yeah. But the going forward, the assessment for 21, I'm sure he'll be taken out, taken out of. Because I thought the date, the enrollment date was October 1st. But, but isn't that for the previous year? Aren't they like... I don't know. I I'm just, sure I just know the I'm date sure. was October 1st. I don't know. The, yeah. Yeah. Be a wonderful question to ask when they're in. Good idea. And I'm sure yeah. you will. <laughs> yes. Can I just, just a general question? Yeah. So if a, if a student... You know, is in the eighth grade, and they choose they want to go. They don't want to go to the high school. Do they have a choice? Can they go to like a a Minuteman instead of a Neshoba? Is, but it wouldn't if the if the curriculum is offered. If they can do a school choice, we wouldn't have to pay for that as long as the curriculum was offered at Neshoba. Okay. This is a um, curriculum issue where it's not currently offered right, at the places. This one is yeah. the, the, the the curriculum that he the student was looking for <coughs> was not offered at Neshoba. Okay. Um, but if if the student was an out of district 
kind of like a school choice, yeah. then we wouldn't have to pay for that job. Okay, so that's, mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Um, so what I do, um, we haven't done one of these formally. We've done some transfers at town meetings, but the, the formal um, way of this is, is that we do a three-part, just signing off. Um, we did this um, four years ago, yeah, I think. Yeah, 16 or something, yeah. I think was the last time we mm -hmm. did it. So there is a formal form. So I did fill that out. I've signed it. Um, and if you do the take a vote and approve that, mm -hmm. um, we'll just meet We'll that provide you with a copy. Would yeah. you like a motion? Well, I think we should discuss. Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry, you're right. Uh, if if you're, anyone has any questions, any further questions? The All amount right. was fifty-one thousand. Yes, yeah, so we totaled between the, with tuition and the tuition and the um, in the end transportation was fifty-one. Mm -hmm. One, it's fifty-one one. Three twenty. Three twenty. Sorry, I didn't have that in front of me. We're, we've already expended and, twenty-two thousand seven seventy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'll make a okay. motion that the Thank you, finance committee make a transfer of $51,320 out of our stabilization fund to meet reserve, reserve fund. Reserve fund to meet the unexpected uh, expense of out of extraordinary and unforeseen. Extraordinary and unforeseen expense of 51320 for the out-of-district placement of a student. Second. Discussion. Um, it's pretty, I think it's pretty obvious. This is extraordinary and unforeseen. It's something that we've, they, they have attempted to uh, seek reimbursement from DESE for. They, we've been denied for it. Um, it doesn't, this doesn't need, especially where we've expended 22,000 already, doesn't need to be uh, something that waits for uh, a town meeting or a special town meeting. I think it's something we can just simply transfer at this time. Uh, we haven't expended anything in four years from the reserve fund. Uh, the current balance is 400000 I, I I feel comfortable doing this. Me too. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. I'll fill these out for you, Darlene, and get them Please, to you. Thank yep. you so much. All right, next on our list, uh, we have a discussion of the town manager's draft fiscal year 2021, recommended budget, operating budget, and draft annual spring town meeting warrant articles. With us, we have uh, Paul Cohen, our town manager, and John Susan, our finance director. And thank you both for being here this evening. Uh, thank you for having us, and welcome back. Uh, <laughs> Yay! <laughs> fiscal 21. Um, Good evening. Um, I'm here to present the town manager's proposed fiscal year 21 operating and capital budgets. I'll start with the operating uh, and budgets, and then John will present the capital as John chairs the capital planning committee. And we mm -hmm. thank you again for your assistance with the capital planning committee. I did print some handouts in case um, members. I know I sent you the files, but I know it's a lot to print. And thank you. And having served in the committee when Strat was here, he he always made a point to make. He sure needed I the paper. Them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just wanted to I'll, I'll pass it along. I like the paper, too. I mean, I read, I read it on the computer, but I like to have the paper, too. Sorry. Thank you. You're welcome. So again, we've got the, uh, well, it's, this is the, the same materials that I presented to the Board of Selectmen on the 27th. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah. since that time, A couple of things haven't unfolded. We've we've um, we've had a meeting at Neshoba Tech where they presented their budget uh, to the communities, uh, and so we, we, we're we're pleased that without, that that um, we're near and recommending their funding level. And we heard the in the Neshoba budget presentation. I also forwarded that out to you by email. Mm -hmm. The link to that document, um, and I think their story is very similar to story of all cities and towns and school districts in terms of the challenges and fixed costs that they're confronting. And then two nights ago, the school committee meeting, uh, Dr. Jay Lang presented the superintendent's proposed fiscal year 21 school department budget, mm -hmm. and they're having a public hearing uh, in three weeks on the 25th uh, uh, at, at 6 p.m. up mm -hmm. at the school administrative offices. And, uh, and I think now that we've sort of seen the three legs of the stool in terms of the operating components of the town, you know, I, my assessment is I think we're in a good position with the community. There are some concerns that we have, and, and we'll note those in the report, but 
I, you know, I think once again, you know, we're meeting the challenges that are confront the community and, and confronting Chelmsford as, we, as we're now uh, into the uh, third decade of the 21st century. Uh, and I think we're in a good spot. So, so without further ado, I'll sort of jump into it. Um, the, the operating budget that I'm proposing is $141.8 million. It's a three and a third percent uh, <coughs> increase in funding. The Chelmsford Public Schools, both my recommended budget and the superintendent's recommended budget are, are, are in agreement at $63 million. Uh, that's, and that's in terms of the budget allocation and the line item. As many of you are aware, there are school support costs that aren't in the departmental budget, but in terms of the money that's voted to the school committee for the school operations, 63 million, which is an increase of $2 million or 3.27% from the current fiscal year. For general government departments, um, the budget's roughly half that at 31.6 million, and that's an increase of 1.3 million or four and a quarter percent over the uh, current fiscal year. The show Tech, uh, again, it's approximately $350,000 assessment increase and over 11%. And if you've seen those budget materials, um, basically what's driving us there is the enrollment change from for the town of Chelmsford. Um, we continue to be the largest sending community to the show Tech. And basically, our enrollment growth virtually was the entire district's enrollment growth this year. And so what that does, and you'll see it in the presentation, it shifts the cost uh, to Neshoba and, and within the budget to us because we pay a larger portion of debt service. Um, the other costs, such as transportation, which are all based on percentage of enrollment. And also, your Chapter 70 money goes follows your enrollment. Um, so so the Neshoba Tech uh, is there. And, um, you know, and, 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 you know we, we foresaw that because when the governor's budget proposed state budget, which is the basis of our, at this point, as we prepare a budget at the end of January, it's the guidepost for the state in terms of the legislator and the governor agree on the, on the state budget revenue growth, which is 2.8%. The governor then produces his recommended budget at the end of January based on that revenue number. And then that gets submitted to the legislature. They hold budget hearings across the state. At the end of April, the House of Representatives will release its version of the state operating budget. The Senate will then pick up, uh, after the vote in the House at the end of April, the Senate will then pick up the budget. They'll vote at the end of May. They'll then form a conference committee with the goal of getting the budget, budget to the governor by the end of June so that it's in place for the start of the fiscal year. As we know, in some other fiscal years, the state budget runs a little behind. The good news for that situation this year is it's an election cycle, so they will want to get the budget done timely because they'll really want to finish up the session, a rather busy session, a two-year legislative session at the end of July. Um, so. So that's where we are in terms of, so again, going back to the Neshoba thing, I could foresee the increase in the assessment, not only by the enrollment growth, but also by the net school spending requirement when the governor released the uh, operating budget and we saw the cherry sheets as well as the Department of Elementary Secondary Education's required net school spending. So, so therefore, that, that explains that. Another big budget driver is benefits and insurance. Um, we're budgeting over $26.3 million for benefits and insurance. It's our second largest item. That's an increase of over 6% to 1.6 million. And then our debt service is sort of the good news that we have is our debt service is, is, is down to 13.5 million, our decrease of 635,000, or almost 4.5%. Um, in terms of the budget, I, I believe it's fiscally responsible. It's balanced. Um, the level of government services are maintained. On the general government side, it's as if we weren't ending the fiscal year. It, we just roll over it. So when June 30th comes, we, we're continuing to operate as staffed as we are. Now, with that being said, I, and you, I don't want to uh, give the impression that there aren't legitimate uh, unmet needs in this budget. And you will hear from them perhaps when you meet with the department heads. Mm -hmm. For example, the library was seeking for Sunday operating hours. Um, the veterans agent was seeking an assistant clerical staff person. Uh, the council on aging was seeking some additional positions. But the bottom line is, given where we are at this point in the process and you know given the experience we've had and, and what we foresee we believe this is fiscally responsible and the other big part that's unknown and you'll hear it earlier uh, later is that we still have unresolved collective bargaining agreements uh, we, we we are still uh, we're now still unresolved with the police sergeants union going back now four fiscal years and we're unresolved with the firefighters union which is heading to arbitration um, we are unresolved with the dispatchers union and we're unresolved with the clerical union. So again, there, there are more costs to come. 
Um, so that's sort of where we're, where we're at, and obviously we have to be mindful of that as we go through this process. I have placed an article, and we'll go over the warrant shortly, as a placeholder in the event some of those contracts are, were to be settled. Um, but here we are in it's first week of February, and I just don't see any movement on any of those items. Um, we also um, have, therefore, there's, you know, there's, as I said, there's no change in services. There's also no change in positions. We have the same number of employees in this budget on July 1st as we, we do today. Um, we also uh, have a capital investment plan that John will go over at $3.8 million that, again, addresses our, our aging uh, infrastructure, particularly school infrastructure. Uh, the, good, the good news is we're not, we're not carrying the debt and, and, and don't have the immediate need for a new school facility. On the other hand, our facilities are, are getting older, and you know, when our newest school building in terms of original construction date is 50, over 50 years old, it's there. So, um, the, and, and also, we, we continue to be, I think, responsible of, about uh, reducing our unfunded um, OPEB or other post-employment or retiree health insurance liability, and then we have no choice but to be meeting the pension liability. So you'll see that as we go through the budget. Um, in terms of the budgetary priorities, this has remained steadfast um, in, in, in what is now my 14th operating budget in the community. I, I look towards education, and I think if you see the superintendent's budget uh, or saw it, I, I actually watched the video of it the, the other evening after the State of the Union address. I, th I think I needed some upbeat uh, time <laughs> uh, after watching the, the uh, and to be nonpartisan, I watched the, 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 uh, the State of the Union address and the response, so I'm not going to be partisan here. So. <laughs> but I figured it, it was a good time to then turn on and turn local. Um, but I think what you can see is I think you can see seeing some progress and investment at the student level in the schools. And again, Dr. Lang and the school committee can speak to that. And again, they have their budget hearing where they'll go through that 170 page document, page by page, mm -hmm. line by line. Uh, public safety, um, uh, capital infrastructure, uh, again, a lot of, as we know, we've really been going on to some of what we call the hidden infrastructure, and John, John will cover some of that in his report. And then obviously health and human services um, as we move forward. So again, getting into the numbers, here's sort of the summary of the line item changes. Um, and again, you'll, if you look at the big numbers, you know, two million to the schools, a million in, almost 1.6 million of benefits and insurance. Um, and then you see our debt service, I said, declining. And then, you know, Neshoba Tech, $350,000, as I mentioned earlier. Public safety, over 400000 Again, without uh, resolved contracts um, for public safety for the sergeants, firefighters, and dispatchers. So the percentage seems low there, but once those were fully realized, it will, it will be higher to the norm. Um, so, you know, so there's, there's some work to, to take place there. Um, revenue, where, where are we foreseeing the revenue, working with Darlene and John? And, and again, I want to pause here in, in terms of mentioning Darlene and John. Um, John really, you know, carries the burden of the budgets. He, you know, he gets out the budget forms, you know, gets the information from the department head, synthesizes it, we meet together, we hold our budget hearings around the holidays, and I want to publicly acknowledge John's contributions towards this because it's, it's really a good team that we have, and as you saw earlier, Darlene sort of staying on top of things such as unforeseen surprises that come in in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the extraordinary education cost. But we're forecasting $141.8 million in, in revenue. Um, again, the big bulk of the new $4.5 million in revenue comes from the property tax. The, it, it's 3.5% because it forecasts a 2.5% allowable increase in the levy under Proposition 2.5, and, and the balance obviously is our forecasted new growth. For, for growth that will end this June 30th, uh, basically, you know, uh, five months from now. Um, we have the state aid based on the governor's cherry sheet. You can see that's a disappointing number in terms of dollars as well as percentage. Well, you can see we're estimating about 4% increase in local receipts, or over $400,000. And then I'll dive into the available funds, which are the ancillary support uh, services for, for enterprise funds and so forth. So, so again, 4.57 million. Uh, taking a moment on the on the governor's budget, and, and again, this will be a theme. Uh, uh, I'll try not to dwell too much on tonight, but it's important. I spent a lot of time when I spoke to the selectmen about this, and I think those watching also need to be aware of this. You know, the, the I guess we can call it an underinvestment by the Commonwealth and the diminishment of the partnership in terms of local aid and particularly education funding continues. Mm -hmm. As you know, there was a lot of fanfare uh, about the education reform law that was passed last year. It has laudable goals, and they're directing money towards needy students and, and, and you know, second language students and, and 
in which English is not their first language and those in, in, in need of financial assistance. However, I think the concern that, that I have, and I think it's shared by the Municipal Association, uh, Mass Municipal Association, as well as other 100 other cities and towns, is that minimum effort going forward. And in the law and in the governor's budget, we're only receiving the minimum of $30 per student. And if you take roughly 5,000 students, you're getting $153,360. Uh, so it, it goes up to 11.35 million, but it's only an increase of 1.37%, which, as we know, is not even inflationary level, not to mention the real inflationary for a school level when you start factoring real costs of school, including special education, including benefits, and so forth. So once again, we continue to see the erosion and, and again, to maintain what we have, and, and you're seeing the struggles in other communities such as Westford and so forth, it's falling at the local level. Um, thus far, we're not at that mm -hmm. level, um, and, 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 and fortunately, the school department has all their contracts settled except for one uh, group that's off cycle, which is a minor contract. Um, so we're not there, but it does present challenges. Also, unrestricted general government aid, which was the, the level that rises and has risen under the current Baker administration, exactly with the level of the growth in the state budget of 2.8%. That only provides us with another $150,000, and you can see that amount is less than half of the Chapter 70 aid. So we get the growth in the state budget at the unrestricted general government aid, which used to be called the lottery and additional assistance, but we don't get that same level of growth of the state budget for the education aid. And that's sort of the rub. Um, and also, you, yes, you, yes, go ahead. Um, so what about the gambling money and the pot money? Well, that's all, based, <laughs> that's all based into the state budget. So that money is all in there. That's factored into the overall state budget. It's not earmarked. Um, even, even the lottery money, you talk about going to cities and towns, is technically not earmarked. Um, so all that's factored in. The only thing that they haven't done yet is they're talking about doing a transportation bill, and they're also talking about perhaps considering legalized gambling. That's not in the budget. But all the revenues from cannabis and from uh, casinos, all that is based into that state's 2.8% revenue growth. Okay. And one of the concerns, if you, if you looked at the Mass Taxpayers Association's analysis of the governor's budget, they're concerned that they're still relying on some one-time revenues. Mm -hmm. um, however, on the other side of the coin, the, the state has made its, a strong commitment to, to its uh, rainy day fund which is their stabilization fund, and, and it's, you know, th so therefore they're hoping that that will be the measure that if, if we do hit an economic downturn, or when we do, because at some point we will, uh, that that will offset some of the, what would otherwise be uh, significant uh, reductions. And, and obviously the state has similar problems that we have. If you follow the state's budget, um, if, as the governor proposed, and want to raise broad-based revenues, they're then trying to constrain with their costs, and a lot of their costs are medical costs, you know, whether it's Medicaid, mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, assistance and so forth, uh, they have their own pension obligations and so forth. So much of that is sort of constrained in the state budget, it doesn't really leave them a lot of room for discretional funding. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things we are concerned about, and you see it's my final point here, is the continued level of underfunding in Chapter 90 road construction. Um, you know, we're, we're now, I think, on the sixth or seventh year of $200 million statewide uh, in Chapter 90 funding, that means 1.2 million for Chelmsford. The estimate from the Municipal Association and the, the towns that provide the data is that's about a third of what we should be investing annually in order to um, maintain local roads. Uh, and that's why in, even in the governor's budget this year, he still maintained that funding level. And again, we're waiting to see what may happen with the transportation bond bill. Um, I, I, as you know, I tend to look at trends over five and 10 years. Um, and again, just to sort of see, well, where's the money going and what's been the you know, change in terms of absolute dollars and percentage dollars, it sort of gives a snapshot over time. You can see, again, the big pictures of what I highlighted earlier. You know, dollar-wise investment, big in schools, $9 million over five years, um, $2.4 million in public safety, $6 million in benefits and insurance. Um, but you can see, obviously, the big one is benefits and insurance expenses are up 31% in five years, um, a major growth category. Uh, looking at the 10-year level, uh, you can see that, you know, the, the trends sort of are very similar. Um, we've invested $19 million in, Ch in Chelmsford Public Schools over the last 10 years uh, to now 63 million or 43 percent increase. The show with tech, you can see that increase is up almost 80, over 86, 86 and a half percent, uh, 1.6 million more than we did 11 years ago. And I remember 11 years ago, they were in the midst of their construction project. Mm -hmm. So again, 
you know, inside, sometimes you gotta look inside the data, but, but it is a real number in terms of chumps at funding levels. Um, uh, yes. question on that, on mm -hmm. over. If yeah. you, in the stuff you sent us, it mm -hmm. looked like, I'm rounding numbers yep. off, like the cost per pupil here was like $16,000. Yeah. And the cost for the showbo was 20 mm -hmm. on its way to 22. Yeah. Uh, is yeah. The difference? Help, help me through that. Sure. I mean, sure. Is that a problem? Is it not a problem? It, on the surface, it has to be a problem. It's, it's largely due to the fact that we're factoring in elementary and middle school education right. as well into the number for Chelmsford overall, mm -hmm. whereas the high school at the Shelburne Tech is only a high school and is factoring in a larger amount because there's more expensive to, to have those courses and those classes uh, for the high school level. So at the high school level, they're relatively e equal. Right. Um, but because the numbers we get from the state are uh, averaged over the entire school populace, it looks as if we're spending less per pupil than we actually are. And also they the, uh, say that the technology, you know, the, whatever their programs are, Mark. Yeah, I was going to mention the other consideration is, David, the, um, the but there all the costs are fully loaded in the Neshoba budget. Mm -hmm. So here in the Chumps, with the Chumpsford Public Schools, a, there are some indirect costs that are buried, if you will, or included in the town, the general government part of the budget, such as facilities, maintenance, benefits for all of these school employees. Those are all in the town budget. So if from the, looking at it from the Neshoba point, their costs are fully baked into those numbers. And the way the state measures it and, and, and levels it is they, they call what's called net school spending. So what happens is at the end of every fiscal year, um, each school district has to submit a re, find an audit report of their actual expenditures. And on the, t on a, the school district, Neshoba, obviously it's the entire cost because they run everything. They're a separate municipal entity. On the uh, Chelmsford Public School side, they get receive information through Darlene about costs that support that. So in other words, Darlene re reports them to the dollar how much of the benefits costs uh, go are assigned to school employees, how much facilities and so forth, and then that comes out to what's called you know the the per pupil cost. Um, so that's how it gets reported. And that way you can see statewide what the contribution levels are. But in in a, in a nutshell, as the chair indicated, it really comes down to the fact that one's a high school and. And when you go K through 12, your cost is significantly less at the lower grade levels. I mean, think about it. You generally have a teacher in a classroom with a second grade uh, who's pretty static as opposed to high schoolers who are moving uh, around electives and so forth and all the things that, you know, that come with uh, high school education. Um, so, um, okay. And um, so anyway, we'll, we'll, that's sort of the 10-year snapshot. Looking at the school item, as I said, we, we, I, I'm recommending a 3.28% increase, which is roughly proportionate to the overall increase in the budget. Remember I said it was 3.3%. Um, I also, again, look long-term uh, over the last decade of, of how we've been funding the schools and the operating budget. And you can see in, in recent years, it's been, you know, you can see the two million now for three years in a row, and that's numbers now dropping from 3.5% to 3.2%. Um, so you can just see, you know, you, uh, you know, again, I think it's been a steady and, and you know, level sort of uh, amount of funding, you know, to, towards educational services. Um, if you look at the chapter 70, this is sort of what I was alluding to earlier in my comments, just the disappointing trend. I mean, you can go back now to fiscal year 11, a, a decade, you, you can see that, you know, there was only one year where you, you know, where you're, you're even at inflation in 2017, but, you know, you're, you're consistently at $150,000 a year, um, is where we now are $30 per student. Um, you know, you, we, Kathy knows you haven't been on the school committee just going in and funding a collective bargaining agreement for, or, or, you know, the, or, or a new bus contract eats up $150,000 a year. I mean, it just, it, just, it, it just shows you the burden shifting um, to the communities. And that's sort of illustrated by, and the, the, you see some of these same statistics in the superintendent's budget presentation, but if you look at what the state says is a required net school spending and, and, what, we, you know, and what we're funding it at, um, Again, I think you can see the progress over the years. Um, and, and again, in terms of, you know, we're back when I uh, began the budgetary process, we were at 5.88% uh, over uh, required school spending. We're now at 35% in the current fiscal year. And the next year, you see the increase is 2.87%. As I mentioned earlier, this budget is, th you know, for the schools is up over 3%. So again, we're, we're, we're still meeting the investment. And if you, if you see the superintendent's analysis, you can see we're about in the midpoint across the state in terms of percentage above net school spending requirements. 
Um, per pupil, this is the point you were getting at earlier. Um, and the, the last da available data is fiscal year 18 because the 19 data, fiscal year 19, uh, which ended last July, they haven't completed the data gathering from uh, districts. So the, at that point, uh, it was roughly 15,000. My estimate as we sit today is that we're roughly 16,000 per student in the Shumpson Public Schools. Um, and then I sort of like to look at that in terms because you know, people often don't recognize it, it, in, the, in, in the year 2020, the education cost. So I started looking at it, well, what does that mean in terms of what it costs to send a child to school per day? And it's almost $90 per school day per pupil. And if you look into a classroom, what, is that, what investment are we making in a, in a 22 student classroom? It's about a $350,000 investment in terms of you know, costs there. And then obviously, you know, over the school days, it's almost $2,000. Um, in terms of how do we compare, um, the superintendent has these comparable communities that, in his analysis. I've also utilized them. Um, and again, these comparable communities are not set by either him nor, nor me. They're set by the, by the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. I also at the bottom put Drake at Tewksbury and Westford as comparable towns nearby. Uh, and if you look at the next slide in terms of the graphic, you can sort of see Chelmsford Falls in the middle in per pupil expenditure, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, amongst our peers. Uh, Drake it obviously towards the lower end, and Tewksbury uh, uh, over at the upper end, uh, and Barricka is slightly ahead of us. So again, it just gives a sense of magnitude. Um, if you then look at special education um, circuit breaker in terms of you know another critical component and actually once again the superintendent had good news on that this year that he's forecasting a continued uh, reduction in, in, in special education out of district costs uh, but you can see that in this case we're we're near the, the higher end we have 80 students who are eligible for fiscal year 20 for a circuit breaker funding um, of a net reimbursement of almost three million dollars which, which um, you know, is, is significant. And you can see graphically we're, we're near the, the top end there as well. So it sort of also indicates the where resources have to be allocated within the schools. And then looking at uh, uh, enrollment and student-teacher ratios, again, from the state database, um, you can see that the enrollment um, can, continues to decline. Um, we're, we're now at 4961. Um, and the number of teachers um, is at 373.2. You're seeing a slight increase uh, as in teachers, which results in your student-teacher ratio now at, at the lowest level that, that has been here since I've been here. Um, when we look at the teacher numbers. That's licensed educators. Licensed yeah. educators. Yeah. Yeah, I don't not, want to indicate. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, just yeah. people in the classroom. Yeah. It's licensed educators. But again, it gives you a sense of, and then if you look at the comparable data, because again, how do you assess when well, you look at peers, uh, in this case, looking at peers identified by the state, there it is in numerical terms, and if you look at it in graphical terms, you can see that Chelmsford fares, um, you know, towards the, the lower end, you know, about a third of the way in, uh, in terms of student-teacher ratio. So again, I think it just, it, it just speaks strongly um, to the numbers, but I think if you speak to the educators, whether it be Principal Murray or Dr. Lang and so forth, you're also seeing outstanding results, and, and also if you see the Neshoba uh, budget report and discussion, you, it's 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 not all about the numbers. It's also about the product and the and the achievement that's being in the schools. And again, that sort of comes to the issue of class size, which comes from from the same thing. The most recent data we have is fiscal year 18. We're under, and again, it's average class size. So that's the key word. The key word being average. But again, you can see the trends are positive. Um, because again, we're in a competitive market. Um, we may not have the newest facilities, but I think we can say we're making the continued investment and we're, make, and, and we're seeing the continued results. And, and, and I know when Dr. Lang comes here, he'll, he'll speak to the, the performance. Uh, and I've seen it in his budget document that I shared with you. And again, you can see in terms of where we are with class size, in terms of fiscal 18, and then where we are, you know, we're right at the, the, at the you know, the edge of the chart in terms of the smallest class size amongst the comparable and neighboring communities. Uh, moving on to Neshoba Tech, um, when I prepared this uh, to the selectmen and distributed it to you, um, m m the estimate was 350,000, 11.29%. I think I was off by $4,000 uh, to, <laughs> to, to the good. So actually, you know, so, so we'll obviously, we'll, we'll incorporate the final number in, in our, you know, final budget numbers. And again, coming back to the enrollment issue, you can see that we're now over 200 students at Neshoba Tech. 
Um, again, that's based the FY21 assessment, okay? This is where the question of, well, where does the assessment, how does it place? They take a census on October 1st, 2019, which is, what, five, four months ago. Um, that affects the assessment for fiscal 21, which we're gonna vote this April. So it's like, it, it looks like it's two years because you're using October of 19 in terms of a calendar date. But as you know, we're doing fiscal 21 as we're right. preparing a budget. So it really is as close as it could possibly get. You can see we have, a f over the last five years, we have 16 additional students. You can see 15 of them uh, from the current year, from 186 to 201, uh, and that's what's driving the enrollment. And again, using their per pupil expenditure, the most recent data that's published on the state's website is over $20,500, 2539 to be precise. And again, if I'm sitting here estimating it, what is it as we're sitting here two fiscal years later, just looking at the trends and also seeing the assessments and so forth, it's roughly about $22,000 per student. Um, moving into the other departmental uh, priorities and budgets in terms of public safety, um, again, we're maintaining our, our staffing levels in the police department with 70 full-time officers, 54 sworn officers, um, you know, includes our nine dispatchers and other support personnel. Um, our ratio of sworn officers per 1,000 residents is 1.59. The national average is 1.8. And if we were to use the national average, then, then obviously we're, we're, you know, we would need additional um, seven officers to go that. Um, in terms of call volume, um, we see that the police call volume, and this is based on calendar year, um, and that's why I used the word year, not fiscal year. This data just came out uh, last month. Uh, the computerized data system that they have for dispatch and calls and so forth, they're tracking over 36,000 calls, almost 37,000 um, with their full-time equivalents. On the fire side, again, we're, we're maintaining it Level staffing at 63.5 full-time employees, which is 52 firefighters, seven captains, a chief and deputy chief, and one mechanic and one and a half clerical support. It's at 11 firefighter minimum per shift staffing. And the fire system has a different trend uh, this year. And they, they, they reported a, a decrease almost to the 17 level. Um, so if you sort of look at data, you probably say they're roughly call volume in a given year. It's probably 66, 67. There seems to have maybe 18 was an anomaly. Spike, yeah. Yeah, so again, you know, again, you're seeing a steady operation. So now you start looking at, well, how do we, what do we have to confront in, in terms of to address the budgets? Because we can't just roll forward, because if we roll forward, we also have to pay people an inflationary increase. And that's really, you know, what happens here. And some of these explain sort of why the budget has to go up and why taxes go up. Um, we've factored in uh, we, our, our union settlements as well as a non-union compensation schedule increase of 2%. Um, that's just under a million dollars. Um, when you also move on to the next page about in terms of employee and retiree health insurance, at this point, the best information that we have is, that a, is to be looking at a 5% increase in, in health insurance premiums. Um, but it's not just the premiums, you also have to look at your enrollment. Uh, but 5% is relatively good news for many of us who've survived some, some rather <laughs> double-digit years of health insurance premiums. Um, we are, we're still awaiting the release of the rates, uh, but we're estimating at this point that 5% uh, <coughs> insurance premium will actually, will actually see about a 750,000 or over 6% increase because of enrollment. And John gathered this data. It probably looks better on color than it does in the black and white, <laughs> a but a little bit better. But the bottom line is what you're seeing over time is the employees are roughly constant. I mean, if you go back to 2008, we had 663 employees receiving health insurance. I mean, here we are 12 fiscal years later, we only have two more employees. So what's happened, obviously, is we had 737 retirees re receiving health insurance benefits uh, through the town in fiscal year 2008. Now that 737 has gone up to 918. Um, fortunately for us, that the cost for Medicare supplement plans and so forth uh, is less than full-time employees, so, um, but, but you can still see it's driving the numbers and driving the, the budget premiums. And um, they cover spouses. Yes, yes, they're in, you're in, you're, you're in, as well as students up until age 25, yeah. So we cover spouses. So if, spouses, if you're a retiree who passes away, your spouse is allowed to continue with the town. Even if the spouse has, has worked elsewhere mm -hmm. yes. and they, yeah. they're yes. entitled to mm -hmm. other benefits, yes. they still... Yes, yes. 
Yeah. So why is the, why are we doing that? Like, why is why isn't someone? It, well, it's not it's not a local decision. No, no. I know. <laughs> no, 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 I no, know no. it's not local. It's a state decision. But why isn't why are we like, you know? I mean, I'm fine. Like, if someone, you know. So do all municipalities do that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And like, state. But, I mean, this is such a burden for us. I'm sure. And this, at a state level, why aren't our selectmen bringing this stuff up? Like, I'm sure we're not the only problem. I mean, looking at this, right? Well, this is a state level, so it's more of a representative rather than rather than selectmen. Right. But um, it, it's like I'm like it's like I get it. Covering children, you have children. That that makes sense to me. But if a spouse is working, has access to other insurance. You're assuming they have access to well, they assume, a, a, you're assuming they have access to other insurance. B, you're assuming that that plan would be better than this plan. Mm -hmm. And C, you're assuming um, that... Uh, I'm assuming a lot, but I'm and, also yeah. assuming that when I retire, I have nothing, right? Like, I have to go, I've got Medicare, and I have but to But that's go the employer you've, you've worked with and the, and the path you've chosen for your work. I, 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 I get that, but most people in the town work... So I have a um, question. Is this, is, this for, is this for all employees, or does it depend on which retirement, like, you know, like the different retirement ones that they no, pick? It, if you pick option A, B, or C, or is it doesn't matter? No, that's for your type. pension. Right. No, yeah, no, it doesn't all, matter. All employees are regardless okay, this is of what all you employees. do. Yeah, and once you and all you need to do is put in ten years, and you're vested in the right. retirement system, in a retiree of the town. Okay. And ten full, you know, full time. Full time employee, which is 20 hours per week or more. Okay, and that's a, and that's a state thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, state. And also, the state mandates that a town must contribute no less than 50% of the premium right. and no greater than 90% of the premium. Okay. Um, so that's, again, all specified by the state. Um, and, the, and then the spouse gets the spouse gets it. The, exactly. You can't discriminate between can't discriminate. the spouse. Okay. No. And they're on individual plans, as John can right. describe. They're, it's not a family plan. It's a, right. they, you, you, you can enroll them in each individual plans for. Medicare supplement, Medicare, and so okay. forth. So this is the su Medicare supplement? Yes. So this is yeah. what, like it's, like... it's like a Blue Cross No, I know what it is, because yeah. I've got, you know, elderly parents, and yeah. I've got a father-in-law. But, so this is what, you know, like supplement for Blue Cross Blue Shield, my father-in-law's $250 a month. That we don't get paid, they don't get paid, no one pays them 50%. Yeah. This is a big dollar amount. It's our biggest thing that goes up every year. Sorry. That's okay. No, it, it, but it, it would just sort of help us explain. No, you know, I, I don't um, know. Um, and and that, well, that's why there's a discussion of OPEP reform, which we'll conclude with this yeah, evening. Um, let me um, know when that yeah. is, and I'll sign you right <laughs> well, we, on that we, one. We, we're not seeing it active. I'll be honest with you, I don't want to give you any false hope. It's not doesn't appear to be on the legislative or the agenda for the mm -hmm. remainder of this fiscal year. That Remember, they go in two-year cycles, and the two-year cycle, which goes with the election cycle, will end. So anything that isn't en enacted by July 31st of this year you start all over from square one next uh, January after the election. Um, so anyway, it, um, it's it's a major it's a major issue. It's obviously a major issue at the federal level. I mean, right? You know, I mean, you know, so it's it's a real you know, it's a real societal and worldwide issue. But if you look at the premium, and this is where it affects the the assembling of a budget, our current fiscal year Blue Cross HMO family plan, um, you know, we're. We're approaching the town's contribution of basically almost being nineteen thousand dollars per person because the total annual premium for the current year is just under twenty four thousand. The town pays seventy five percent, so this is an HMO family plan. Now you factor in a five percent increase, you're almost nineteen thousand dollars per per uh, for family I mean, plan. That's now, unbelievable. Yeah, but but that's you know it's 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 the reality. It's also the reality in the private sector. Oh right? yeah, that's you a healthcare know, system issue. Healthcare system issue. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other big driver is the retirement assessment. Mm -hmm. um, John sits on the advisory board, uh, and, and I usually go to the quarterly or meetings and so forth. But the town's fiscal year twenty one assessment was known. We because they do it in two year increments, and right now they're doing the new uh, actuarial evaluation for January first of two twenty twenty. So that'll probably be out this summer or early this fall. But our assessment for this year is going up over 7.2% by $639,000 to $9.5 million. That we're going to cut, John will cut a check on July 1st or shortly thereafter because we're going to get the early pay discount of $9.5 .9 million to, to the county retirement system. For, and, and again, if you look at the, the data there, the big, the big column is that fifth column, which is called payment on unfunded liability. And, and you can see the normal cost is up 50% from a million 10 years ago or so to 1.5 million for the upcoming fiscal year. But the big driver is the payment on the unfunded liability going from $4 million to $8 million 
um, this upcoming fiscal year. So our assessment, you can see, if John didn't send that check in July, it, we'd be paying $9,685,097. As you can see, we get a discount by, by to $9.5 um, by, but again, it's still a $639,000 change, just opening the doors uh, in July. Uh, and again, this unfunded liability, we're, John can speak to it even better than I can, but we're expecting to see at the retirement level six to seven percent increases basically till 2035 when at this point it's scheduled to be paid off. And that's assuming a re investment rate of return of seven percent. Right, right around seven. So it, it's. Um, and this is because this no is, one it was never funded before. It was, it was right. They, they converted, it was they converted from a pay as you go. It was converted from pay as you go mm -hmm. back in, and they, they en enacted these changes in 1988. And, and, and in fact, I started my career in, in the year 1990, and I was there, and they were t this was pension form would come in, they were gonna, and that obligation was gonna be paid off in the year 2018. Mm -hmm. It was 30 years, <laughs> and then what happened is political reality happened. Whenever the state hit a downturn, they would push the cycle out to provide relief mm -hmm. to cities and towns. So it went from 2018 to 2021, to 2025, to 2035, and now I think you can go to 2039. And so, again, that's why when I use the word 2035 payoff, I put that in quotations because it likely will be after that for two reasons. One is you may have ec economic challenges, and sort of related to that, you may not get the market re rate of return from the investment. Never mention the fact that they keep updating their actuarial tables mm -hmm. because people are living longer as well. So they do, I will say this about Middlesex, and, and again, they're overseen by the state. Yeah. The state does all their investments, uh, and the state also monitors the, their their actuarial charts and their performance and so forth. And so the state's looking at it, a comprehensive picture. They are current. I mean, they're using you know, today's mortality tables, today's trying to get to today's investment returns and so forth. But the, when you keep bringing those constraints into reality, the costs go up. Can I ask yes. kind of an unrelated question? So say if you're retired mm -hmm. on our medical plan and you move out of state, does that change the premium or anything? Like are you in a different plan? Like if you move to Florida? The, 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 you, know, you can be in an out-of-network out plan. Uh, if you, and there's two categories of retirees. There are the under-65 uh, retirees, and then yeah. there are the Medicare retirees. The, it's more expensive for out-of-area for the under-65 retirees um, mm -hmm. because you, you know, you're not in the network. But once you get on Medicare and so forth, you're pretty well set. And it really isn't the burden. In fact, that's the expensive retiree cost of those who are under-65 because you're really providing yeah. an HMO plan. Wait a minute. So retirees for under-65? Yes. Yes. So if you work for the school department. Yeah, you have early retirement incentives. Yeah, for 20 years or, you know, in your age X, then. Age X. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the state, I mean, what happens. That's how I like to refer to. That age. Right. Yeah. That's how I like to refer to myself. Age, age, age X. X. <laughs> and age question mark. Right. And yeah. public safety has an early retirement, uh, a greater benefit than, than non-public safety employees. Mm -hmm. So in other words, basically, you tend to max out if you come into the system at age 55 or so for public safety employees can max out. They have to retire at age 65. Uh, and the same thing with teachers can leave earlier. Whereas what, what's called group one, which is more administrative and uh, personnel, you have a different um, retirement pension uh, schedule. And those ages haven't changed? Like, no. Like social no. security? Like for no. our age? No, no. And if they do make changes, they really have to go uh, prospectively because the courts have determined that if that when you become an employee, you almost have a contractual obligation into the pension system. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if they were to walk in tomorrow and say, "Well, we want to change it," so your retirement age is seventy, you you'd have to grandfather everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'd have to grandfather everybody mm -hmm. going in. Also, to be fair, um, the contribution made by people today in terms of their pension system is a lot greater than it was, yeah. you know, a generation ago when you had people contributing five percent of their pay. Now you get eleven plus two percent. Um, so you ask people who are actually contributing 13% of their pension. But they're guaranteed. Right, right? but they're guaranteed. They're right, guaranteed. But, but, but if you look at what their contribution is to what they'll receive, it, it's not as disparate as it was when no, no, you were on a pay-as-you-go no. system. But it's still compared to the rest of us who have to fund yeah. our own 401k and but, we have but no guarantee. But that's guarantees. fact. You, you, you're, you're also contributing only 6% as a Social Security person as opposed to somebody who's contributing double no. that. Mm -hmm. And also the, the employer is a town. Um, if we if we went to Social Security today, we would cost us more. Oh yeah, definitely. Because mm -hmm. the town doesn't contribute six percent of our payroll to Social Security, 
So, the, so it, 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 as much as it looks not like, apples and oranges, it's, it's not apples and oranges. oranges. Not apples it, and apples. It, exactly. Yeah. Okay. I don't get to eat early retirement, guaranteed pension. Okay. And neither do we. Well, we're not going to discuss it. <laughs> I'm just saying. Right? We can have this okay. argument later. All right. So going back to the liability, uh, as I said, the last actuarial was done on January 1st, 2018, which, as mentioned earlier, there's a new one being done based on January 1st, 2020. Our liability unfunded pension was over 105 million dollars. The unfunded OPEB liability of July 1st of 18 was 67.7. So you can see the total liability is greater than our total budget, $173 million. Our, this budget contains an 8.153 assessment, which is required, as I mentioned earlier, for the unfunded pension liability. And we're recommending an appropriation of $1,545,000 towards the unfunded OPEB liability. Um, the, another big driver in the budget uh, is solid waste and recycling. Um, many of you are familiar with the whole issue of, and you've, whether you watched 60 Minutes or heard present, budget presentations before, about the whole issue of re the recycling markets and the, the challenges there. We now have a significant, as significant challenge in the solid waste market, i.e., the where landfills and trash energy plants. Um, the problem is the amount of capacity to dispose of non recyclable solid waste, which is, you know, your trash, for lack of a better word is diminishing. Landfills are, are hitting capacity and closing. The state's not licensing any new landfills. They're not building any new um, uh, burn facilities in terms of, you know, the electricity plants that burn mm -hmm. solid waste. Um, so what's happening now is there's a shortage of solid waste, landfill, trashed energy plants, and other solutions. Other solutions, for example, is rail. There, some communities actually exploring sending mm -hmm. out on rail cars or, you know, to, to Ohio or to <laughs> South Carolina. The, uh, the, you know, it's a huge liability issue. Here. It's a but huge liability is, issue. It's a huge liability issue, and, and the problem is what's basically meaning is when we now go dispose of solid waste, our current contract is $72 you know, dollars per ton. The new contracts and the ones that will hit us in a, a fiscal year from now are in the $90 level. That's the market. So, you know, you've, you've, so you've got, you've got, you're now paying, you know, upwards to $90 per ton to dispose of either recycling now that the recycling market's collapsed or solid, or solid waste. Um, so in this budget, the collection costs are only going up by 2.2% or $39,000. Uh, that's because that's really just factoring your price of gasoline yeah. and labor for the people running the collection trucks. The problem is the disposal costs are going up by $945,000 or nine and a quarter percent. Um, so again, this is a total increase of over $120,000. Um, another big area of concern, again, some of this we touched upon back at the December joint budget meeting is the facilities maintenance. Again, as I mentioned earlier tonight, we have 26 buildings, you know, the playgrounds, fields, um, and we're also seeing it, you'll see it in the facilities budget when Kathleen comes in, you see it in the lines on, in what I passed you this evening. We're also receiving real costs in terms of occupational safety standards um, and obligations to meet. So again, I, I have a $100,000 increase there. Um, property casualty workers' compensation. Um, the problem here is the market. You've got a, you know, as we, there's two things going on. The replacement cost for buildings is rising significantly because of construction inflation, which means your insurance costs to, to replace a building, because that's where we're on. We're on a replacement schedule. Mm -hmm. If tonight the high school burns down, our policy provides us to fund a new high school. Mm -hmm. It's not what's the value of that 1974 building. Mm -hmm. It's what would be to have a similar building today. And obviously, you don't insure the land. You insure the structure. Um, and you also have a, 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 a tight market for property insurance um, and other uh, um, insurance premiums. Um, and also, your workers' comp obviously grows with your payroll. Uh, and they come in and audit our payroll every year. Um, so again, we're we're forecasting a nine percent increase, or, or you know, mm. or seventy thousand dollars there, and then Medicare taxes directly tied to your payroll. So mm -hmm. your payroll's going up. You know, we're now we're paying over a million dollars in Medicare mm -hmm. tax, which is an increase of forty five thousand dollars. So again, you start putting them together on a sheet, you're roughly five million dollars if you just take these aggregate large scale impacts that I just described to you. Um, again, the bit of good news is that our excluded debt service is declining, mm. but the key word is excluded debt service. <laughs> um, and that's the one time, you know, vote that allows property tax to be raised for specific projects. In our case, in Chelmsford's case, it's really the previous phases of the sewer project, as well as a little bit with the DPW building and so forth. But um, that's going down by $580,000 of 13.75%. 
that's great news, but the challenge for the operating budget is that, is that doesn't free up any money in the operating mm -hmm. budget because that's sort of the set aside when they look at, well, what's your permanent allowed levy and then what's your temporary levy? You know, but it's good news. It, it, otherwise, you know, the, the, the increase in taxes would be greater. Um, again, we, we, we quote this every year in terms of debt service from the, our bond rating agency. Overall, our net debt as a community is low at 1.5% of market value. And, and obviously, over 85% of this debt is scheduled to be repaid within the text, next 10 years, most of which, again, is a sewer project that will be paid off in 10 years. And it's also because we don't have a school project on the books. Right. You know, mm -hmm. And so, you know, so we're in a good position at some point when a community has to take on a project, uh, a school project, you'll be, you know, you'll be relatively good position. You, know, you don't, won't enjoy paying for it, but, <laughs> but, at least, but at least you're not sitting there overburdened with debt. Um, and so again, looking at the debt numbers, you can see that non-excluded debt service, we're, we're sort of constant. You can see we're roughly 7.5, 7.6 million dollars mm -hmm. for non-excluded debt. Um, and so again, it's a nominal decrease of over 21,000 for fiscal year 21. And, but as you look at the next page, the excluded debt service, you can see we've dropped down, you can see the drop from 5 million uh, back in fiscal year 15 to 3.65 million this year. Um, and then I do provide, as I mentioned earlier, the, the general government FTEs uh, that, I, that I referenced uh, earlier in terms of, we saw it in terms of the health insurance subscribers. Even the number of FTEs, which includes everybody, those including those not taking health insurance, um, you can see it's the same number as last year, 251.4. Um, again, there's not a large influx of employees. And again, if you go back to all the way back to fiscal year 08 before the Great Recession, we were at 240. Um, so that sort of you know, speaks to sort of a level staffing overall trend in the town general government side. Again, flipping over to the revenue side as we're nearing the end of this presentation, the allowed two and a half percentage increase, a mathematical calculation is $2.5 million. We're projecting 1.7 million in new growth. I, I mentioned earlier the state aid numbers uh, come from the governor's cherry sheets and his proposed state mm -hmm. budget, local receipts and, and so forth. Now, you, again, like looking at trends over five years, the, the key, key number is the percentage number in terms of, if you look at the percentage of the budget, what, where the funding sources are, over five years, we've gone from 75% on the property tax to 77%. You can see the state aid dropping from 13.45 to 12.5%. Local receipts, um, 8.6 to 7.65. Um, and, and more importantly, is the bottom of the page. And over five years, our Chapter 70 funding is up only 8.4%. And that's where you see those low, low numbers I saw earlier. You start compounding that over five years, it only comes up to 8.4%. However, you did see, as I mentioned earlier, the, the bigger increase on the current governor and general government aid uh, of 18%. You now look over a 10-year period, um, and again, you can then see that, that the trend in the budget from property tax goes from 74.33% to 77. The state share drops from 14.44 to 12.49. Um, so you, again, it, it's what I mentioned earlier about the shift onto the property tax. Uh, and again, if you look at 10 years of Chapter 70 funding compounded, uh, you know, at 15.5 percent, it just shows you how abysmal the state's commitment has been to education funding under Chapter 70. That over a 10-year period, we have 15.5 percent. Um, and then, it, however, again, you see a larger amount, in, particularly in recent years, on the general government aid of 29 percent. Um, if we had just had that um, 20, same level of commitment to Chapter 70 funding as the growth in general government aid, we'd have another million and a half dollars mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in state aid. So again, diving into the property tax revenue, um, again, this is the uh, levy capacity from the property tax at 4.2 million. There's the 2.5% in allowed increase. Um, based on the base levy of 101.8 million, and then the 1.7 in new growth. Um, looking at aver you know, average single family tax bill allocation, if you take that 7362 number and you apportion it by the budget allocations, again, the money goes where you'd expect it would be. Schools are 45% in the nominal of the school department budget. Uh, eight, the second largest category is benefits and insurance at 18% or 1325, again, for that. Um, 400 and some odd thousand dollar home that has a $7,362 tax bill. Um, looking at valuations, you may have seen this with, you know, the, the, the trend in terms of property appreciation and investment in the community 
tends to be in residential because even though some of these residential properties are commercial investments, such as the apartments and so forth on Turnpike, that's considered residential valuation. Mm -hmm. So you can see we're, you know, we're at 82.63% this year, uh, which continues to grow. Um, average single family tax bill, uh, the data isn't complete for the current year, but you can see the values in the community uh, are, the average value is now approaching $450,000. Um, but you can, you, can, you can see we're roughly around that 70 level. You know, when, when, when all is said and done, the, the number will be high 60s, low 70s, um, you know, probably high 60s in terms of one being the lowest, uh, I mean, the highest property tax bill in the Commonwealth. Um, so again, you, we try to, just like we do in education, everything else, we try to look at metrics. If you look at comparisons um, for five years compared to us, to our neighboring communities, Chalmers actually has the smallest growth in the average single family property tax bill it's just over 16 percent, although our bill is the second highest. Let's you know, let's not. But and and Tewksbury probably has the, the largest amount. But that's because you may recall they again you always got to go into the numbers. They've been shifting some of their sewer debt into their property tax levy. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it just gives you a sense of of, of comparison. Uh, in state aid, again, you look at the state aid. Again, the two big numbers there are Chapter 70, which is your education funding, on slide 58, and general government aid, which, you know, again, formally called lottery and additional assistance, that's, that's your bulk of it. Everything else is sort of noise, um, although you, you still got to pay attention to the, to the um, you know, to the other numbers because they can move you around. Like, for example, you can see that the charter tuition reimbursement jumped significantly this year to 192, where it had been 100,000 this past year. And again, that was another small part of the education funding law. Um, School choice tuition, you can see the trend on that from the school department uh, is diminishing. Um, there's a number of choice students are, are, are fewer and fewer in the schools, even with declining enrollment. Um, and again, they'll be making decisions soon in terms of what, what classes and such they'll seek this year in terms of school choice. Um, you can see our veterans benefits, that's reducing because remember that's 75% of the actual amounts paid in the prior fiscal year, so the veterans benefits is is uh, reimbursements reducing because our veterans benefit outflow, and you'll see that in, in Regina, when Regina comes in, and you see it in the numbers in the operating budget. We're reducing the budget there because, fortunately, the economy and such is, is fortunate that we're not receiving as many claims from veterans. Um, and then local receipts, we're budgeting at 10.84 million and working with Darlene and John, looking at the trends. I mean, th that's that's sort of, you know, the only number that exceeded it in recent years was fiscal year 19. Uh, with 11.8 million, the big driver there is the first category: motor vehicle excise, 5.6 um, percent, 5.6 uh, million. It's roughly 50 percent of the number. That's the big wild card. Um, um, and again, those numbers are holding strong in recent years. But we know that's a that's a, a consumer purchase that can be delayed when you start when people start getting a little antsy. Uh, because one can postpone purchasing a new car or re renewing a leased vehicle and so forth. Um, and then the other big one that we're seeing in significant years is permit fees. Um, we're budgeting $1.2 million. Um, you know, again, that's really dependent on what's happening in the economy as well. And so, you know, again, we tend to be conservative here, but, you know, the 10-8, the we're up, again, 4% or 415000 um, 10 8 would be the second largest number on record right now, uh, below the what we believe was the peak in fiscal year 19. Um, and then the available funds I mentioned earlier and didn't spend much time on, this is sort of the ancillary stuff. You know, we take $6,000 from the wetlands fund um, to support the operating budget. And then we have all the betterments um, you know, in terms of their benefit costs, um, both the sewer betterments um, appropriation to fund the sewer project which we're nearing the end of that. Uh, the sewer enterprise fund offset for their benefit employees, child care revolving fund, and then the final phase in of the stormwater enterprise offset. Um, and then I do give an inflation measure. I mentioned earlier about the effect of inflation over the years. Um, again, the trend in more current years is higher rates of inflation, which makes the squeeze even a little tighter. Um, they, they do it every other month. That's why we only have through November um, and for the 19 numbers. but. The bottom line is, you can see in the last three calendar years, inflation has been over 2%. Um, and then a capital plan, I'm going to defer to John, and, and, and John can uh, go into the capital budget. Um, 
And, but, but in closing, before I turn it over to John, just, uh, just sort of talk about the, the issue again, once again, because I think it's worth repeating. You know, if you want to reduce the reliance on property taxes, the, the other real viable source is the state. And again, if they're funding us only at the level of $30 per student, it's not keeping pace with inflation. And also the Chapter 90 roadway monies, again, only being about a third of what's needed to maintain our roadway infrastructure. Um, and then again, about OPEV as a closing note, um, the states either go look at e either increasing the minimum age and the minimum years of service in which former employees become eligible for retiree health care benefits, as well as prorating on a ba basis of, of service. So in other words, your pension is based upon your number of years in the system and your age when you retire. Retiree health insurance is just based upon 10 years. You get 10 full-time years, you're in. Um, it, you know, so you're, you're, it's not tied to your length of, uh, of employment mm -hmm. like your pension system. So with that, I'll, I will turn it over to John who can walk you through the capital part and then we can go back and look at the draft warrant. Okay. Thank you, John. I beg you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, I'd like to walk, give you, take you through the uh, FY21 capital uh, proposed budget. As you may know, the um, Capital Planning Committee finished meeting uh, last December, in, uh, and uh, we were pleased to have Amina represented the Finance Committee at all of those meetings. Um, the first slide shows you. rolling here if we go to the this first slide shows the um, the major the the capital plan broken out by functional area and you just see some of the major um, the major areas investment public safety just over half a million public works 875,000 school facilities just over 1.6 million and then school technology which is a security project uh, is just over 270,000 we'll go through these in much more detail in the slides ahead this year, the amount of recaptured funds from prior year completed projects is uh, a little less than it's been in the past. It's just over 2,800. So the total to be financed through, um, through bonds would be th just over $3.8 million. The first area we'll take a look at is municipal technology. Uh, we have a project for 105,000. This is to add, add security cameras and switches to the network. Um, our technology staff has works in, uh, hand in hand with the Chumpson Police Department, and uh, they've done a good job at, um, you know, as you know, cameras are becoming more and more important than ever. Uh, some of the locations that are looking, we're looking to add cameras that would include Roberts Field, the Town Common, uh, cemeteries due to, to, to try to reduce uh, any vandalism and uh, problems there, uh, certain traffic intersections, as well as the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail. Moving on, the next project under municipal administration um, is something that, um, as you know, our town clerk has spearheaded in the past. Um, this is a continuation of that project. Uh, there are a number, there are some archive storage rooms in the basement of this building. Uh, the funding uh, includes plans to provide a plotter and scanner to one of the rooms to install some data lines and, uh, and, and enhancements on lighting and, and shelving. Next area that we'll look at is under community services is our senior center. Um, as, as many of you know, this building dates back to uh, when it first opened in the late 1980s. The kitchen is um, original to the building. Uh, there have been some small improvements over the years, but uh, as, the, as the senior center director and council on aging explained to the committee, um, you know, the kitchen now that it's over 30 years old, um, it, has some, it has some issues. Uh, the ceiling needs to be replaced with a washable commercial grade material so that the ceiling is washable. That's a, that's a health code. Mm -hmm. The floor needs replacement. It also provides for new lighting and a new HVAC exhaust system, um, as well as some 
There'll be some new appliances. There'll be a little redesign of the area so that you have the cooking and the food prep areas separated. Mm. The cost of that's just over 244000 Moving on to the library, the two projects there. Um, at Adams Library, this is phase three. This is the final phase of the carpet replacement project that you've heard me talk about uh, for 25000 as well as um, this is phase one of a two-year project. They've, they're doing a computer replacement, looking to replace approximately 31 computers. The last uh, time, this, this will actually replace computers that were purchased in FY16. So this is a periodic thing, as you know. The computers only last for so long before they become outmoded. Now, the price tag on that is just over 28000 Moving on to the police department. I have this classified as police, but in reality, this will benefit both uh, public safety departments, police and fire. Uh, this is a full upgrade of all of the radio repeater sites and receiver sites. Um, as Chief Spinney explained, many of the current components, they're over 20 years old, and the problem is that the vendor will no longer support the components after December 2020. This also includes an, a, an upgrade of existing radio antennas uh, in the town. And the price on that is just over 176000 Moving on to the fire department, there are two projects there. Uh, one is also related to radios. Uh, 267000 investment will replace 24 mobile truck radios and all of the fire trucks, as well as 61 portable radios used by firefighters. Mm -hmm. um, the second project, uh, as you know, all of the trucks are numbered. It's a pickup truck, it's a heavy duty pickup truck used primarily by the mechanic and for plowing. Uh, the existing truck's a 2012 Ford F-350, you see the mileage. That 2012 truck is going to be repurposed within the fire department and it's going to replace a 2002 pickup that's being used as a backup. So obviously with the nature of the fire department's uh, work, you, it's very advantageous to have a backup plow truck during snowstorms. Can I just ask you a question? Sure. Um, on the radio upgrade, those are mobile. So if we got a new truck, we would stay, we'd keep those, right? They would, we wouldn't, that's right. not part They're of the mobile. Yes. Yep. Okay. Moving on to public works. Um, first two are traditional infrastructure type projects, 325,000 for sidewalks. Uh, one, of the, one of the areas DPW will be targeting will be the Bill Ricker Road, Chumsford Street intersections. Um, we have half a million budgeted for road improvements. Um, this includes 52,000, the pavement management survey that you've often heard DPW talk about, and I've me also mentioned it. An engineering firm comes in and analyzes the condition of all of the roads in town to prioritize them for repaving. That's included in that amount. And some of the roads that are uh, possible that are on DPW's list to be um, repaved include Katrina Road, Jordan Road, and Church Street. The last project that you see is a it's a GI it's it's an update that's scheduled for our GIS or Geographical Information System, which you know that's used by a lot of, a number of um, divisions within DPW and also other town departments. Um, the existing data we have is quite dated; it goes back to 2003, 2004. The total cost of the project, just want to explain to the committee, is actually 150000 However, because this is used by a number of DPW divisions, the cost is going to be equally allocated one-third to the general fund, so 50000 to the general fund, 50000 to the sewer enterprise fund, and 50000 to the stormwater enterprise fund. Moving on to municipal facilities, uh, we have two SUV type vehicles that are looking to be replaced with hybrid type vehicles as part of our green communities initiative with the state and, and the grant program to try to move more towards um, you know less uh, to more fuel efficient vehicles. There's a 2012 Ford Escape currently used by the facilities director and a 2012 Jeep Patriot that's currently used by primarily by the public works director. The existing vehicles here, the 2012s, will be repurposed. I know the Ford Escape is going to replace an aging pickup truck um, used by the library. And so the, the good news is the existing vehicles are going to be repurposed down the line, so to speak, into less demanding uh, departments and, and, and work for those vehicles. The cost for that is 100000 and moving on to school facilities, just to walk you through some of those. Um, 
one of the priorities that um, Dr. Lang explained, and these are the priorities of the school committee, is uh, the, the school committee want, wishes to continue making some uh, badly needed upgrades in many of the school kitchens. Um, this year, you recall that last year we had a project that involved the Byam, Harrington, and South Row kitchens. Um, as Dr. Lane explained, when the projects went out to bid, the, all of the bids came in well over estimate. So we're seeking 188,000 to have pr enough adequate funding to, to finish those, the, those three kitchens, as well as um, 641,000 is included for Parker Middle School. And you can see it's to upgrade the kitchen and food prep areas, new flooring, and the serving lines and furnishings. Another project related to school kitchens is code compliance upgrades, and by that we mean, you know, basic uh, Board of Health codes and things of that mm -hmm. nature. This year, the Parker Middle School kitchen will be targeted. Um, as I've explained in the past, um, this is a continuation. The, the schools are looking to eliminate the wooden prep prey areas that you see, like there's an example there of a butcher block style table that really needs to be transitioned over to stainless steel for sanitary reasons. Also in the Parker Middle School, looking to install a washable ceiling with additional lighting, new exhaust hoods, et cetera. And the cost of that's just over 122,000. And that's addition to, is this an addition to the other kitchen upgrades? Yes, that's an addition to the other kitchen, kitchen okay. upgrades. And then at McCarthy Middle School, as you know, that building dates back to 1959. Um, the auditorium, um, it, you know, it's, it's basically time for a renovation there. This, this project will fund the replacement of the lighting system, the sound system, and the seating. Is the seating original? No, that's been replaced at some point. I spoke with the facilities director, and they felt that to the best of their knowledge, although, you know, none of us go back that far, that their feeling was the seating may be original. I'm sure the lighting and the sound system being electronics yeah, yeah. would not go back to the original. It but feels original when you're sitting here. It feels original. <laughs> it feels original. <laughs> Do we have anybody here? I wasn't around. <laughs> you were in Maine. Kid. Yeah, I was in Maine. <laughs> we have to stand up when you're in the auditorium. <laughs> <laughs> That's because it was outside. And then the final project is, um, involves school security. As you know, school security is a very important topic these days. Um, this, this, is an this year, the, it, the high school um, is slated to receive these improvements and includes um, improvements to controls and door monitoring. Um, also includes panic and lockdown alarms, as well as it would be tied into the police dispatch center. Um, as well as a building intrusion system would be, a new building intrusion system would be added. And uh, the cost for those improvements is just over 270000 And that's all the high school? And that's all for Chumpswood High School. And then the next steps in the capital process are, as you know, um, April, April of this year, um, town meeting will, will make the ultimate uh, decision on these projects and consider them. And then um, following that, um, in June, I'll uh, be working uh, with our financial advisors to um, issue municipal bonds to finance these improvements. And the very last page is just a list that you'll see in the budget uh, book at town meeting and, the, and, the, and also in the finance committee report. This is a complete list of all the projects that are included. That table. Okay. Okay. So th that concludes the capital budget. And I just have some closing remarks. I also passed out to you around the table, the enterprise fund budgets for sewer, stormwater, peg access. Mm -hmm. um, sewer one, uh, again, we have an established and, and now completed and sort of stable sewer uh, enterprise. The budget is up, I think, 0.15% or, or, you know, it's <laughs> it's 60s, you know, the, the total enterprise fund goes up by, you know, less than $13,000. And the, and the good news there is, is that, you know, again, we're talking level employees and static and also another year, and I think it'd be a heading into our fourth or fifth year of level sewer rates. Mm -hmm. um, so again, you know, that's sort of what's going on in terms of sewer operations. We are exploring the challenges of our sewer capacity, uh, and so we'll probably be back at a fall town mm -hmm. meeting or, or so forth in terms of, because we're at capacity, in terms of our allocated limit, but certainly not at the plant, and, and we're working with the city of Lowell 
and efforts and, and also they are seeking to increase the capacity, license capacity of the plant. I also pass out the stormwater enterprise fund budget. This will be the third and final year of the three year stepped in phase in of the, of the uh, sewer enterprise uh, operations. Um, and so, so that has, and again, you can go through that with the, um, with the uh, um, public works director and, uh -huh. and assistant public works director and you, you recall we, we sort of were delayed the, we were delayed and then we did year, year one phase in year two and now year three um, mm -hmm. and again our levels are sort of what we're seeing with our comparable communities Tewksbury and Westford and so forth in terms of funding levels um, and then the last one is the peg access again the, I think the peg access budget is going up thirty nine thousand dollars in terms of uh, total budget uh, and then with their indirect expenses it's 42,000 again that comes from the cable access surcharge on the Verizon and Comcast bills um, we are not we've not seen the decline in revenues um, you may have been reading in the press some of the challenges that they're already seeing in Westford uh, in terms of their peg access position and so forth mm -hmm. we haven't seen that yet uh, but we do have a healthy reserve uh, in terms of free cash and the enterprise fund uh, so again working with Pete and Pete you, you'll have Pete in and Pete's given a conservative budget. Again, no changes in staffing or personnel there uh, in terms of their operations. Um, so, so those are sort of the final legs of the stool. And, and I guess just in closing, um, you know, it, it's, it, it's sort of deja vu all over again. You know, the story has sort of been stable uh, and probably will be stable um, through the state project process this spring. I don't think anybody has any visions that there's going to be any kind of radical change in state aid or or or, or you know it, it seems that the legislature with the remaining five months of the budget year are going to do a transportation bill uh and and going to adopt the state budget and then some other priorities um as they really squeeze everything into the july period so i think from our perspective what we see is pretty much what we're going to get um just because the you know that that's you know where we are and assuming the economy stays st stable so what does that mean going forward well as we <coughs> look forward I mean you know in a year from now and so forth you know you're likely going to see the the continuation of what's really been the trend over since the economic recession this current fiscal year the average single family value was just under four hundred fifty thousand dollars I think you know when, when when we're here a year from now uh, when the assessors meet in the fall and set the tax rate and everything, that value will continue to increase. You know, you'll be certainly over 450,000, maybe hitting to the high fours. Uh, and also, you're, you're going to see, your, you, you know, if, if the state aid isn't there and we're at levy limit, you're going to, right now, this average single family bill is 73.62. Clearly, you're going to see an average single family bill going to probably 76, $7,700. Uh, and what's happening? And, and the question was, and it, and it arose the other night, even at the selectmen's meeting, is, well, what can we do to mitigate that? And, and what I'll point out to you, and, and, and you've seen is when you look back to the earlier slide about the budget drivers, um, if you look at what's really constrained, um, no matter what we do, the Neshoba Tech assessment's coming. I mean, we, you know, that's driven by enrollment. Mm -hmm. We know that's going to get passed by Westwood and the other communities. So there's 350000 out of the chute. Um, we know the, the health insurance premiums and premium coverage, that's coming. There's another 750,000. The retirement is a given number. That's another 639,000. Mm -hmm. The solid waste and recycling, again, that's market dependent. We really have no control over that. Um, the Medicare tax, the, you know, the issues of property insurance and, and workers' comp premiums. And so really what you're going to come down to is that if you really want to make any meaningful impact to go before, below the levy limit, you're going to have to dive into into the operations of the town and and most notably about two-thirds of that would have to be the schools you know because the the bulk as we saw earlier 45 percent of the departmental budget goes towards the school and if you saw the number in terms of departmental wise it's two to one ratio so in essence let, let's say you wanted to cut a million dollars out of the budget your tax rate would still go your taxes would still go up and perhaps it might not go to seventy-seven hundred dollars, but it'll probably go to seventy-six. It'd probably go up two hundred and some odd dollars as opposed to two hundred and you know eighty dollars. Um, but the bottom line is you're going to see the impact, and I think the closest you can see what that would mean is if you look at what's happening over in Westford right now with the struggles that they're having in terms of funding their school system. You know, would they have a similar enrollment and similar challenges that that, that we do? Um, we, we'd you know, it, it just reflects the realities of of that if you, you know, you, if you're not getting the state investment, 
your your cost drivers are still there, you know, you're you you eventually would have to go into you you really you can't you can't cut special education, and so you're really gonna you really have to go into the core. But the tough part is is you it's and we saw this when and, and we lived it when we were in the in the issues of the recession. You're really gonna impact. And, and one of the things and why I'm referencing this is that if you look into the superintendent's budget, a number of his uh, increases are really driven by, you know direct contact with the students. You know, he's looking at class size at the center school in terms of keeping them at a level of 20, 20 per student. Uh, he's looking at the needs that are there in terms of additional tutoring and aids and, and, and learning levels at the lower levels and so forth. So, you know, I, I think, again, when I look at it holistically, and that's sort of a wrap up from my original comments, I think if you look at the Neshoba Tech uh, budget, you'll hear, when they come in, you'll hear the same stories about their fixed cost drivers. You look at the investments that have been made at the Chelsea Public Schools, and, and I think what you're seeing here is, I think in overall, it, it, it is responsible. Um, and when those darker days come, you know, you know, we will meet those challenges. But I think where we are today, this is, this is a responsible budget. And I want to thank you for your time and, and patience this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and lastly, before I leave the table, the item that you, other item that you have for me, and I'll pass this around, is the draft of the warrant for the spring annual town meeting. Um, this draft, the Board of Selectmen will be looking at it Monday night, and then two weeks from Monday night on the um, 27th, they'll be signing the warrant for the spring annual town meeting. Right now, there's roughly 30 articles. This is an, another re really vanilla town meeting. Um, the, you go through roughly 70% of the articles, more than that, are, are articles we have at every spring Budget town articles, meeting. Yeah. Hearing reports of officers amending the current fiscal year budget, we will have a few amendments just because it's the nature of what happens. Funding for collective bargaining agreements, placeholder. The Neshoba Tech assessment, again, we put them first because they have to go to Groton that same evening, so we mm -hmm. act on them and send them on the way. The fiscal year 21 school budget, operating budget. The fiscal year general 21 general government operating budget. Uh, we have a citizen petition for air quality studies uh, under Article 7. We have the Finance Committee Reserve Fund. Uh, which we're proposing funding at the same level uh, as we are this fiscal year. The fiscal year 2021 capital budget that John just reviewed. A charter amendment that the Board of Selectmen have requested to increase the Board of Health from three to five members. Um, Article 11 is the fiscal year 21 sewer enterprise fund operating budget. Article 12 is the Milan Avenue sewer pump station reconstruction. You may recall we funded the engineering work for that at the fall town meeting. Article 13 is the stormwater management enterprise fund operating budget. Article 14 is the Forum Enterprise Fund Operating Budget. Article 15 is the uh, placeholder for replacement of the air chiller refrigeration system at the Forum. Article 16 is Do the we, Sorry, no. We're still working on that estimate at okay, this point in time, it. but it would come, it would, it would come from the uh, uh, from Forum that. Enterprise Fund That's free what I thought. cash. Okay. Article um, 16. 16 is the, uh, it was that. Article 16 is the PEG Access Enterprise Fund Operating Budget. Article 17 is PEG Access uh, Chumps and Telemedia computer servers to support the PEG access. Article 18 is the Golf Course Enterprise Fund operating budget, again, unchanged from the current year, much like the forum. Article 19 is the annual appropriation of departmental revolving funds. Again, it's probably a consent item. It's, there's no change. Mm -hmm. Article 21, another consent item, Cemetery Improvement Development Fund, um, same as request as they continue the project over at uh, the cemetery. Um, community Action Program Fund, another 10,000. Again, another consent agenda item. Article 22 is the request from the Conservation Commission for cranberry bog tree removal and maintenance on the bog dam. Um, that's followed an engineering study that the commission did in terms of preserving the life of the dam. And in fact, they're going for permitting uh, soon. Uh, that'll be advertised, so it'll be ready for town meeting. Uh, Article 23 is the Community Preservation Fund debt service, uh, administrative expenses and reserves. Article 24 is the only community preservation fund request for funding. That's for the preservation of historic vital records by the town clerk. Article 25 is a placeholder right now for potential amendments to the town stormwater bylaw, which is required as part of the state and federal uh, new regulations. That may or may not, it's, I think it's like a flip <laughs> of the coin at this point. With, they're trying to figure out what the, what the required date is and, mm -hmm. you know, Maybe maybe a fall town meeting of the spring. We're not sure. And then the next three articles have to do with road e roadway easements. One is for Ledge Road and Oak Hill for um, bus turnaround. Uh, the second one is the intersection of Ledge Road and Dunstable Road for turning radius. 
and then Boston Road and Concord Road easements for the reconstruction of a T intersection at Boston and Concord Road, which is funded by the, the uh, federal uh, gasoline tax, federal monies. Article 29 is a placeholder for street acceptances. Mm -hmm. And then Article 30 is just a placeholder at this point. Um, we, we are, we're scheduled to open bids next week for the South Row School roof. Uh, remember the partial roof replacement at South Row School. So we just have a placeholder there. We don't know how the bids are going to come in. We're working with the MSBA through that reimbursement program, so uh -huh. th we just have it there. So it may just in case. It, just in case, yeah. we'll know next week if it does, it'll appear on the warrant. If not, it'll go away. Got it. Um, so that's what we have, and you can see it's not, you know, it's not there's nothing uh, earth, you know, earth shattering or historic there. But that's where we stand at this so point. We so we say. So we say. No yeah. zoning. No zoning. There are no zoning requests from the planning board. None at this point in time. Um, there, and there, are, there, aren't any, aren't, there are not any forthcoming from the planning board. They're, they're, they're scheduled to meet next Wednesday. There's nothing on their agenda. Uh, and okay. again, if the, you, you know, so there are no zoning articles. So it might make it a quicker town meeting than we have <laughs> had. <laughs> so. Those are the famous last words. I know. I know. I know. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Oh, can I ask one question? Sure. On the last um, town meeting, we voted select board. Yeah. That yeah. Whole yeah. Do I know where that's at? Yes. Did it get submitted? It's been it submitted, yeah. and and uh, and it has passed the House. It is now up for consideration in the Senate. So the long story of it is, is it will get done this spring or, or early summer. Mm -hmm. It will get done before July 31st. Mm -hmm. Where there are, as you saw, there are numerous communities who are doing this. So now, the, I mean, it flew through the House. It's in the Senate. I don't have a date for calendar action in the Senate. Mm -hmm. um, but no, it's not official yet. And Westford is right there with us. They submitted at their fall town time, meeting, yeah. and so their bill's there. So I would expect, you know, it took the House a couple months. It'll probably take the Senate a couple months. So you may see it around May or June. We'll, we'll see. Can I ask another follow-up to town meeting? <laughs> sure. Uh, it goes to the community preservation fund. Yeah. How many people apply for the money for the awnings and the, for their buildings, the business? Oh, the facade program? Yeah. In fact, the invitations are going out this week, um, so it hasn't basically it hasn't gotten off the ground yet. Okay. So, but but it but in speaking to Evan, um, the the information is, is going out um, by before school vacation week, okay. so it's it's out there. So we, we may have information for you perhaps the end of before the end of your session in terms of applicants and so forth. But no, that program is moving forward. Okay. All right. And then I just realized I had another question. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's to okay. Best. That's all right. Uh, the I know it's a minimal amount, but is there an amount that is saved for putting the wires underground in the town center? Yeah. And is it you we, know, what 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 would be the time year wise that it would take to get to the point where we could consider doing that? here's where we're at. The the we have roughly three and a half million dollars in national grid monies. Um and, and in fact, the National Grid surcharge that was turned off a oh, oh, half dozen years or so years ago. What's holding that project up is the Verizon surcharge monies. And when we say, why is it Verizon? It's because the Verizon money come from landlines. Uh -huh. And as we all know, the number of landlines and landline usage is diminishing. So you're roughly collecting about a hundred, just over a hundred thousand dollars per year. Hmm. We're in the black now. Uh, the first phase of the project put us into the red. We will receive a. They, they sent us an annual statement at the end, as of March 30, March 31st. Um, so we'll see that in about two months. What the available balance is in the fund, we have, we are seeking to re-engage Verizon to see at what point we can move forward with that. That that's the problem. Is it's it will cost millions, without exaggeration, to to bury the lines through the center. And the and the biggest cost is the Verizon cost. And you say, well, why is that? One is you're going under the brook, that's in the center. But two, if you've ever looked at the poles and stuff in the center, those are major Verizon trunk lines that go down towards Bedford, believe it or not, through the center of town. So that is not, that's a significant project. Um, and, and, and therefore, we're trying to work to find out how and whether we can get that done because it's that significant. And that was known from the very beginning. The, what wasn't known when the town approved that a generation ago was plus at this point was no one foresaw that when you everybody moved towards these devices mm -hmm. there's no surcharge on this because it's not tied to a physical address 
Mm -hmm. And so the, basically your, your revenue stream went out. The legislature has not amended the state law, which again, we fall under in terms of how can we assess the surcharge, it's set by state statute. So the only choices the community would have would be to augment that with community preservation funds. I was just going to, I was uh, circling that, around that the That would community. be the way to do it. And that, but that would be a significant, that's probably worthy of a significant discussion at some point in time. Um, and, pr you know, we'll, perhaps that would happen once we get, can get some clarity. We, we've engaged VHB, which is our consulting engineer for this project, to sort of if we can get together with Verizon and, and sort of get a, more clarity in terms of, you know, what is realistic. And, and the next step would be if we need assistance to go to our legislative delegation to see if we can move it forward because that's the problem is it's not a, you know, you, it, it's a prolonged payment period. If you're talking millions of dollars and you're only collecting in the in the hundreds of thousands, hundred plus thousand per year, yeah. you know you, 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 they're not going to do a project <clears throat> with a 50-year payback, and so that's that's been the challenge. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll 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 see how what we can do there in the future. Um, so that's where that stands at this time. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Thank you, John. All right, next on our agenda is a reorganization discussion and vote. Um, we can either go forward now, or we have two members that aren't here tonight if we want to push it off to next week. Vote for what? Reorganization. It's that time of year. <laughs> the time of year when we stick it to you? It's kind of. Up to you. Make your choice. <laughs> it's a, I, I, if we want to vote on it tonight, we certainly can. Uh, I, I, I'm fine with deferring to next week where we have two board members not here, but I will entertain a motion if you so choose. I, I make a motion that Jim remains chair. I'll second, I second that. It. Second. Okay. Discussion? <laughs> I think you do an excellent job, and I hope that we can be better at helping you. I second that. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm abstaining. <laughs> For obvious reasons. Yeah. And then, um, Anita, would you like to remain as vice chair? Does anybody else want it? Don't look at me. I'll make a motion that Anita Tanini be the vice chair. I'll second. Any discussion? What a lovely job you've done. <laughs> you fill in very well when you can't make it up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All right. You know, my term's up in, 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 in June. Just, I'm just saying. This one. Yeah, this this coming June, at end of June, yeah. I this term. This term. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, moving right along. Discussion uh, of liaison assignments for fiscal year 2021 budget review. Did you email us out there? I haven't before? emailed you the form. I realized that after I uh, looked at it this evening. Uh, I have the form, which I can send out to all of you. Um, I'd like us to get going on this, see, seeing as we're in February. Um, I don't imagine people are going to want to move around too much. Is there anything, any, any particular uh, uh, department that people want to go to that they didn't go to before or that they, um, they don't want to go to anymore and rather do something else? I'd like, I'd, honestly, I'd like to just, I, I can't do more than two, so I'd like to just keep the police Keep, keep the ones that you have. The, yep, okay, that's fine. They're the only two that can really meet on the weekends. And so I can, time, so. yeah, that's no, so what I can, I can well, let me just run through who's, who's yeah. Currently, yeah. currently where. Um, so Board of Health, uh, it's been you, Anita. Yeah. Capital Planning's been you, Kathy. Uh, um, oh, that's wrong. Oh, I'm sorry, I mean it took it this year. That's, I apologize, that's right. I did, yeah, but I already did. Yeah. So you've put, in, you've put in your fair share. Um, cemetery, David, I, you, you were on Cemetery last year. Oh, that's fine. Okay. As long uh, as we get moving, because I'm only here for a week and a half, and then, <laughs> and then, then, then you're flying south in the winter. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Fair enough. Well, if you want to meet, reach out to David Boyle this uh, tomorrow, even, yeah, and, I was let, say, I'm and see if he's ready to come in, we, we could do it next week. You sanction it, I'm out yeah. here. Yeah, sounds sounds good. Uh, for uh, Charleston Public Schools, we have Kathy, Amina, and and you, Dave. You, you want you guys want to do that again? You want to take me off of that? You want to take you off of that? Okay. Anyone else want to join? I'll I'll, I'll ask Eric and I'll ask yeah, Vicky ask too. Eric, yeah. And also, we again we'd have to get that going right away. Which. Yep. You know, I don't know when Eric's back. Well, when are you? He's back next week. But when are when are you back from uh, from your trip? The fifth of March. The fifth of March. Well, that because because they usually. They usually come in in uh, late March anyway, because okay. uh, they have their public hearing coming up in two two weeks. I think yeah, it is. which is going to be uh, tele te televised, which you could watch, um, you know, in your spare time. Yeah, and you saw, and you saw, yeah, yeah. So it it doesn't preclude you from being on that because again, usually they come in mid March, right. late March anyway. That's fine. Okay, um, community preservation fund, Kathy, you're still on that. Okay, you want to continue. And David, you're on the senior center? Absolutely. <laughs> I didn't say you were a member of the senior center. I, I asked if you were sitting on the committee. Uh, if you want to, yeah, want to reach out to, to Deb again um, and see when she wants to come, that'd be great. If she wants to do it next week, we wouldn't happen to have her. Um, myself and Eric were with DPW Waste Sewer and Storm. Uh, I'm fine with continuing that. Uh, finance department and accounting, Anita, you were, you, you, you seem to knock all these out at once. Uh, finance department, assessors, um, information technology, uh, treasury and collection. Mm -hmm. You want to continue doing that? Yep. Perfect. Uh, fire department, uh, you met me and you already mentioned, and Eric was on, on with you last year. Yep. Library is Kathy and Dave. You got, you got, um, you still want to do library? I, I bought. I did the library. You, the year before, we did the library together. Together, and you didn't do it last year, so I'll take you off. That's fine. I love the library, as we all do, but I'll keep the library. Does Vicki have anything? No, we have to do it better. Well, we'll see if Vicki wants to add to that. I'll ask where Vicki wants to add, too, because she was on. She might want to do the school department. Well, she did Neshoba Valley last year, along with Eric and David. Do you want to take? You want to get off Neshoba no, Valley? I'll stay on Neshoba Valley. Okay, that's fine. We usually do at least three I people got on my that. Right here, right? Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. I missed the breakfast. That's right. You'll hit that before you head south. That's yeah, fantastic. I've already done it. Oh, that's right. You already did it. Yeah. I've yeah. already done the breakfast. Yeah. Um, well, it's you know it's what nine thirty on a Friday. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. all. I'll, I'll, I'll never make that. Um, Peg access, um, Vicky, Vicky did that last year. I'll see if she wants to do it again. Uh, police department, it was you and me and me. And yeah. I mean, four, four years run, so keep going. Uh, public, public facilities, uh, me and Eric kind of knocked that out when we do DBW and, and all those departments. Um, and then veteran services, Anita. Yeah. You want to keep, yes. keep doing that? Okay, perfect. All right, so I'll ask Eric and Vicki where they want, want, where, if they want to change anything or fit in, but I think that stays the same. And what I'll do is I'll send these out to everyone. Mm -hmm. Just like we did last year. I'll um, reach out to Chief Ryan, and I'll CC Eric on that email. Perfect. Do you want to reach out to Chief Spinning since you yep. did that last time? Yep. I will certainly do that. Uh, high school. So, so what I'll ask you to do uh, is I'll send these out. I'll send this list out to all of us, mm -hmm. and then um, start contacting and see what we might line up for next week. And just keeping in mind that I have to post next week's agenda by by Tuesday. So if uh, people are ready to come in next Thursday. Great. If if not, we can adjust the agenda accordingly. And then, as far as town warrant articles, that we don't have much to go with yet. We'll add those in as we go along for the ones that aren't already budget items. Okay. Um, um, anything else? What was on the agenda next? Well, on the agenda next is um, discussing the budget hearing and spring town warrant article schedule. Okay. So. Thank you, Pam. We have had the schedule for this year. So our, uh, we've opened up our, our budget hearings with, with tonight's meeting. Um, and we've been presented the draft warrant articles, the finance, um, the finance budget, and also uh, the capital plan budget. From here through um, really the 26th of March is what we have available for, for, uh, for hearing dates. And then we want, want to try to take the votes either the 26th or the 2nd uh, at the latest so that we're ready to go. Uh, town meeting is on April 27th this year. 
uh, which means that our book should be out no later than the 13th of April, really, uh, which means basically post it on the website on the 13th uh, and the book either done or just about done uh, being printed. Uh, so the final date for the recommendations will be the 9th and, we're, and, um, and panel will be finalizing it in the next few days after that. Uh, so that gives us a little bit of little bit of room, um, but we want to get going and make sure we fill in those fill in that schedule. I don't know what people's uh, February vacation looks like this year. I know mine's open, but I know we've had that's been an issue in the past. I'm gone that week. You're gone that week. Okay. Anyone else gone that week that you? Well, well you'll be gone that week. Yeah. So we have that's two right here. I'll check. I'll check with Vicky and Eric and see what we have for attendance that week. I'm always here. I know, well, same. <laughs> well, it, oh, it's that time of year. It's that time of year. I'm always <laughs> here. So. I am going away um, in March for a few days that would include a Thursday night. Um, test, test. I don't know, like, for the warrant voting, I'll be away from the night. I'll miss the 19th. Should I the last? The 19th of March? I won't be here. Yeah, we won't be voting that night, so, okay, so. don't worry about it. I don't, on the I don't plan on voting until at least the 26th, if not the, on the, okay. if not the second, depending on uh, how long <laughs> things take and how many people can come, can come in. So, earmark those two dates, and I'll remind us in the email that the 26th and the second are the ones we're holding for the vote. Hopefully, we can do the 26th in a little more time. If not, the second's available. All right. That leads us to public comment. Anyone in the public want to comment? We have a public. We do have a public. Yeah. That's unusual. <laughs> All right. Hearing none, uh, I see no press. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn. I'd make a motion that we adjourn. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. See you guys next week. Thanks. Jim, will you reach out to